name is Jeremy Allen Gould, and this is the Who's to Say podcast. Being a lifelong music and art fan, I was lucky enough to book a lot of bands back in the day and have been even more lucky to stay in contact with many of them. I grew up all over, and my love for music and art only intensified the older I got. This podcast are conversations with many artists in many different capacities. Thanks for stopping by, and I hope you enjoy what you hear. With that said, who's to say? Welcome back. This next episode of the Who's to Say podcast, we welcome the amazing Mark Nix. Mark is best known for being the singer and the multi-instrumentalist in the band Cool Hand Luke. I first met Mark when he was playing drums for the chaotic band The Chariot. Mark currently is a father, a pastor, and a therapist in the Orlando, Florida area. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mark for this next episode. And with that said, Mark Nix, Who's to Say? Hey, buddy. How's it going, Mark? Good. How are you doing? Good, man. What's what's new, man? I am literally in between counseling sessions. I'm, among other things, a licensed mental health counselor, and I had a free hour. So That's awesome. Well, I appreciate you, you coming on, and I know we had talked about doing this for a while, so I'm really stoked that you, you gave me some of your time. Yeah, glad to do it. Yeah, man. Well, I just wanted to uh, start with, I just was, I was trying to think the other day, I, I kind of catch back up when, when we first met. I know, I know, I think it was the Chariot show when I, that I had booked in Wichita at the skate park. Uh, is that the right first time? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Playing drums for them. And uh, what, what tour, was it just a Chariot tour of, I don't know, was it a package? I don't remember exactly. Do you remember? We were, pr- we were probably in between tours because I know that year we did a pretty long tour with Throwdown and then a really big tour um, supporting Under Oath and at the time I think it was a headline show that we did when we were with you and it might have been with the Handshake Murders yeah I think it was yeah yeah that meant something which, right which um, was one of the old guitar players from Esso Karras, um, which if people don't know who Esso Karras is, their singer is now the singer of Norma Jean. Yep. You know, I think Jason, the guitar player, just passed away too. Oh, really? Yes. Yep. Probably about six to eight months ago, something like that. Yeah, I oh. reached out to Brian, the other guitar player, when it happened. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but yeah, it's yeah, it just kind of was a sudden thing. Hmm. So, it's it's awful. He was a sweetie. <laughs> he was like one of those gruff sweeties, like you know, yeah. just total gnarly dude. But he's so he was awesome. So, anyway, um, and then so I know I I booked you with Cool Hand with Acidies Burn too. I think. Mm-hmm. I, yep. I think at the Eagles Lodge was that the only two times I think. It's. I think it, it might was. it might be. It, you're one of those people that I feel like just knows everybody. And so it's almost hard for me to like pin down exactly when and where we've crossed paths. Cause I've sort of known you from afar for years, but that, I think those are the only two shows yeah. that you promoted for us. Yeah. I, I remember, I remember it was Assays Brown. I think it was like oceans firing or something like that. Some, some band like that. I can't remember right off hand, but yeah. But yeah, that's awesome. That was I remember those vividly. There's certain sh- it's funny because I did so many f- shows, but it was like there are certain ones that are, are still like lodged in the memory. That's one of mm-hmm. those that was was amazing. How did that tour go? It was good. It's funny, like um, m- many of my Cool Hand Luke memories are colored by what I was going through at the time. And I was just like super depressed. 
Mm. Um, and just had a lot of like personal life stuff going on. Like I think at that time I had like recently broken off an engagement. So that just kind of colored everything for me. So the, the tour was good. There were definitely good moments, but even, even when I run into like one of the As Cities Burned guys, I feel a little bit embarrassed because the, like they probably see me as this super emo dude because I was a pretty emo dude on that on that tour. But yeah, that's awesome. I just ran into Aaron at a Furnace Fest for the other day, so it was nice to see him. Yeah, but uh, awesome. Um, so let, let's go back a little bit. I know you've probably done this a, a couple times on um, some podcasts, but just uh, maybe a brief history on kind of how you got into music and and uh, put you on this path. Yeah, so I grew up in Nashville. Um, a lot of people assume I moved there for music, but I just was born there. And my parents are from like the country, like grew up poor on farms, like an hour outside of Nashville. And so I was raised very much like a Southern man, like hunting and fishing and NASCAR and stuff like that. And I had an older brother who was in all that stuff, and I tried to be into that stuff. And it never felt like me, but I was just like, well, this is what guys do. And then <laughs> probably when I was in like sixth grade, I heard Led Zeppelin, and I was like, holy crap, that's what I want to do. Um, yes. So I became obsessed with like Led Zeppelin and particularly John Bonham and drums and started just kind of teaching myself to play drums on like cardboard boxes while listening to cassette tapes of Led Zeppelin. And, um, and also, uh, my older brother was in marching band. And so every, like when I was in middle school, every Friday night, we'd be at high school football games and I would just like stare at the drum line and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And so it became, I, so I had kind of like this rock drum thing and then this marching drum thing. And both of them were like, that was my world. That's what I wanted to do. And so I ended up working real hard and making the drum line. And it just so happens it was one of the top like drum programs in the nation. So it was like, if you stuck with it, you were going to become a good drummer. So I did that all through high school and beginning with college. And then um, my freshman year in college, it was literally, I think, the last week of school. Um, I went to a, well, I thought I was going to hang out with this girl, but it turns out she invited me to this thing that there was like literally like 50 people at. And I didn't even like get to talk to this girl, but I got introduced to Brandon and Jason and they were like, Hey man, you want to play drums in a Christian punk band? And I was like, Nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cause I, I didn't grow up with Christian music. Um, and I just thought it was all like, you know, Amy Grant and Same Michael time. W. Smith. Yeah. Stuff like that. And, and frankly, I went through like a punk phase in high school, but it led me more toward like Fugazi and stuff like that. So just the idea of like, you know, MXPX or something like that wasn't that cool to me. Um, but something compelled me to call them a couple of weeks later and they, Brandon and Jason, so uh, Jason played guitar, Brandon played bass. They had played together in like their youth group band and were already best friends and had already decided they were going to start this pop punk band and it was going to be called cool and loot and so we played and there was just no discussion of like is this a good fit are we going to do this again you know like what are you thinking it was just like okay so when can you when can we you know like practice again and we just kind of hit the ground running and 
our first show, we were not ready to play a show, but um, Goaty Hook was playing kind of like a last minute fill-in date at this place right outside of Nashville called Cafe Express. And in our little like teenage minds, we thought they're on tooth and nail, so they're huge. And if we open for a band on tooth and nail, we'll be huge. <laughs> and so we only had like four songs and we had only been a band for like a month, but we booked this show and it was, I could go into all the details because it's actually really funny, but it was, it was a dumpster fire. <laughs> um, and years later, we were on tour out on the West Coast and we had played at this place called the Chain Reaction, um, which is a pretty small venue, but it's one of those like iconic, like most indie rock kind of bands end up playing there. And we stayed with um, Rory, who was like the guy at the militia group and his roommate was the bass player from Goaty Hook. And we ended up talking to him. We're like, do you remember that show? And he was like, oh yeah, you guys were like the worst band we've ever played with ever. <laughs> so so that was, that was our humble beginnings. But we just um, took it really seriously and practiced a lot. And, you know, within a year, I'd gone from just being the drummer to singing probably 60% of the time. And our sound was already starting to veer away from like pop punk and more toward, you know, emo, screamo, um, something like that. So like our very first EP, we were in this weird transition where there's like some songs with like some almost like hardcore breakdowns and there's some pretty parts and then there's like a fast almost like you know punk kind of beat to yeah. one of the songs um and and then i guess it just continued morphing more and more over the years yeah were you writing most of the songs then or were you, was it a collaboration or like how, it was, how was that going it was very much a collaboration. It was just the three of us would get together and a lot of it happened in the room together. You know, we would all bring different ideas, but it was really exciting how collaborative it was. And then I would usually, music came first and then I would usually work on lyrics um, kind of after the fact and melodies and things like that. And that's the way it was um for several years while while it was the three original members and then at some point i started kind of teaching myself to play piano so i could have more melodic input so i would come in with piano parts or things like that um you know probably 5 years into it yeah. I think I think by the time you booked us, I was mostly playing piano live. I think you were. I think you and, were. And just a little bit of guitar. Yeah. Um, so when you first started the band, was did anyone else did you just were you de facto singer or were it was it like did we just have the best voice or how did that No, I mean we Brandon, our bass player, was the singer. Um and if we had gone for the whole like <clears throat> you know punk thing he probably would have been the guy um he kind of had like it's funny i listened to like the old stuff that brandon sang on and he sounded like some of the shoutier parts on like old get up kids or something like oh, that yeah. oh yeah um but when we started doing more melodic um, things that I guess required a little more range of emotion, um, I don't want to say like, I mean, I frankly wasn't a good singer. Um, I think I got better, but I, I, there really wasn't a discussion. I think I just started stepping up to the plate more and saying like, hey, I got an idea here. And Brandon was never territorial about it. Um, 
So it's funny that I don't remember there ever being a discussion about like, hey, Mark's the singer now, right? It just slowly happened. What's funny is I do remember, you know, probably two or three years into us like touring pretty extensively and I was already established as like the singer of the band. Brandon and Jason, after a practice one day sitting down, I was like, basically like, we don't think you're a very good singer and we kind of want to be an instrumental band. Um, and I was a little bit blindsided by that. And the funny thing is I don't remember how I responded to it, but I don't think we ever talked about it again. Wow. <laughs> so, so, um, I, it's funny. I'll have to talk to them and see what their memory of that is. So I don't know if they were like, man, that conversation did not go well at all. And, you know, Mark didn't get the clue. Um, but for whatever reason, I kept plugging away being it. the Well, I the love same. your voice. I think it's incredible, honestly. Well, thank you. Yeah, man. It's but um so back on the or I guess continuing with this, um if you uh, I was I just asked I had Eric Collins uh from Denison on the other day and I just yeah. Pop in my head. What what's what's your favorite song you wrote with Cool Hand? Like, what's your favorite record you wrote? Um, just curious. Mm. You know, kind of the ones that you, if you could, uh, pick cherry pick the ones. You know, well, which which ones do you, are you the most proud of? I guess I should say. Yeah, I think, I think overall the album that I'm most proud of would be, <clears throat> of Man. Um, like, if someone has never, like, the world I'm in now. I, I'm a pastor and I'm a mental health counselor. And so most people are not like, you know, seen kids or I guess now seen, seen dads. So like people find out I was in a band and if they're going to listen to something, I'm probably not going to send them back to our like four song demo cassette tape of pop punk stuff, you know, and, and of man, I'm very proud of that record um, and I, I wrote it all and just had different friends play on it. By that point, the band was just kind of Mark and whoever plays with him. Yeah. Um, so I'm proud of that. Um, I think it has aged well, but the same way tours kind of are colored by like what was going on in my life, um, I feel that way about records and there's some records that I think our fans like that maybe don't feel as good to me. Cause I know of like what I was going through or turmoil within the band, but I fought against myself was our first like self-recorded self-released full length. And it does not sound good, but the songs are so freaking cool. And it, it felt like, it was the beginning of us like firing on all cylinders. We were working hard. We were playing really well together. And I think like the old school Cool Hand Luke fans still like, there's a song on there called 10 or 40, which probably isn't even my favorite song, but like it starts with just a drum beat. And like, like if an old school Cool Hand Luke fan hears that, it's just like, oh yeah, here it is, you know? And and that brings back good memories to me. And I still talk to Brandon and Jason and uh, they, I think they had probably talked about it without me at some point. And they're like, man, I would love for us to get together and re-record that and like make that album sound good. That would be awesome. Um, yeah. Part of me thinks that would be really cool. Part of me thinks if we're going to put that much time and effort into something, I'd rather create something new. But, um, but then like when I hear in my mind, the record sounds really cool. And then I hear it and I'm like, Oh, that sounds like crap. <laughs> uh, so it would be cool to give some, what if you just did a song. What if you just did one song and see how it turned out? Yeah, that, that would be worth doing. I think. Yeah. 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 Jeremy, you you may have just ignited the fire. Oh, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, 
Well, just uh, what do you think uh, the best tour Cool Hand Luke was on? Like, what uh, what do you feel like was the most beneficial or most the funnest or whatever whatever you can tally? There, so one of the funnest tours we did, we did this really long tour with Noise Ratchet, oh. and it was and it was kind of like. They had lined the West Coast, and we had lined the East Coast was the easiest way to describe it. But we were just with them for like two months over a summer and became really good friends with them and just had lots of fun. And that was when, like, you know, I think we had I think we had just signed to Floodgate and everything was new and exciting. And we were really good friends within the band. and just lots of great memories from that. Um, and then probably the two biggest tours we did, um, when Switchfoot first started blowing up, we were on tour with them and actually Dennis and Mars. Um, and we were like the first of three and we were very naive about like that bigger, like that kind of like next level, world um and you know we were definitely the peons like nobody knew or cared who we were but it was just cool to be able to play some of those rooms and just you know playing sold out shows every night but probably the coolest and like best for our you know career or whatever we ever did was we did a tour with Norma Jean and Me Without You, and it was just so fun because we were just such good friends with those guys, especially the Norma Jean guys. Like, we go way back when they were ludicrous. Yeah. And um, every show was big and people were excited. And it sounds weird now to think about Cool Hand Luke and me without you and Norma Jean being on tour together. But back in the early and mid 2000s, like underground was underground. And like you were united by like, you know, we've got this common thing and who cares if, you know, we're an emo band and you're a hardcore band or whatever, like we're just all friends and it just worked. Um, so that, that tour was super fun. I would have loved to have booked that. That would have been, that sounds like a cool cool tour. Yeah. Um well that brought me to my next set of questions. Floodgate Records. You know I'm mm -hmm. a big Tim Tabor fan. Um tell me about that process and and uh what brought that on and how that was for you and um uh, yeah, that's Yeah, it's funny like enough time has passed like I feel like I can tell you things that I've probably never said like on record before, but we had been talking to tooth and nail and they had sent us contracts and um, Jason's uncle actually was a lawyer. And so he was really like going after this and he eventually <laughs> wrote Brandon Ebel an email that said, if you had an 18 year old son, would you let him sign this contract? <laughs> and I think that <laughs> did not land well with Brandon Ebel. Um, so we, I mean, we are probably in the fourth round of revisions and we're at that point, we're thinking like, we're going to sign a tooth and nail. And, um, and so I later found out we were blacklisted. Like it was just common, like no, like to all the like, you know, uh, AR guys like Cool Hand Luke is blacklisted. Like no, nobody try to sign them. Um, but we also had been talking to Atlantic Records, which is really weird because this was around the time that like POD was really big and um Atlantic and some of the other big labels were starting to like sign some like kind of indie Christian bands and get them to cross over. And um <laughs> we actually ended those talks because uh, ironically the 
guy we were talking to, he asked if I would be willing to start being a front man and stop playing drums live. And we and we were all like punk rock and we're like, we're not we're not selling out, you know, and all this stuff. And then like, you know, just a couple of years later, I'm not playing drums live yeah. anymore. And, you know, but um, so we put out a seven inch uh, and few people know this, but we did that seven inch because Atlantic wanted to hear some new songs. So we went and recorded two songs and they wanted to sign us based on the merit of those two songs, but we ended up just putting out a seven inch. Then, um, so we were looking for a label that had integrity. Um, there were, there were other like, you know, underground Christian labels, but they were kind of not known for putting out high quality stuff. And, um, I won't name any names, but, uh, you know, we were like, yeah, you could do that. And you would have your, record and Lifeway or whatever, but, <laughs> you know, like, uh, not good recordings yeah, and all that stuff. It. Um, and I think it was actually, um, Aaron from Copeland was telling me about Tabor and about, um, Floodgate because he was friends with the Dennis and Myers guys and was telling us about it. So, we started checking that out and I don't remember how we first talked to Tim, but he was pretty immediately interested. Um, and I think, I think Tim had aspirations for us to be like the next Coldplay or something like that, which we, cl we clearly weren't, but um, like, I, I think he, had high hopes for us, but we genuinely liked him. And, um, I, like I said, I didn't grow up with Christian music, but I had heard of the prayer chain. Cause, um, I remember in high school, like, just like having friends who were into Christian music, they were like, Oh, there's this band called the prayer chain. And it's like alternative, but <laughs> they love Jesus, you know? And, uh, so when he started asking us who we wanted to record with, you know, we're like shooting for the stars. And we had, um, at that time, Sunny Days, The Rising Tide was out. So we were trying to get in with that producer. And I was trying to get in with Ken Andrews from Failure and all this stuff that was like, yeah. you know, way out of our league. And he was like, well, you know, we always work with Steve Hindelong, why don't I see if he can do it? And Steve Hindelong was right on the heels of making these monumentally huge albums because he wrote God of Wonders and wrote, you know, um, you know, these worship songs that were big and was wor working with all these um, big CCM bands, but his nickname was Indie Hindi. So I, th I think Tim knew like he would go for something that was a little more artsy. So he got us in the studio with Steve Hindelong for our first record and everything. It was just like this exciting blur. We went from, you know, this band that everything was DIY and we had nothing to all of a sudden we've got a label and we've got a press person and, uh, you know, like we did an album release at tower records and there's these massive like album cover things behind us. And, you know, we're like, what is this? We're like a real <laughs> band. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So Tim was very good to us. Um, I wonder if he ever recouped, <laughs> on all the money that he spent uh, on us, but he was, he was very kind to us. That's awesome, man. He's, he's a great dude. I, I admire him quite a bit um, just in, a, in the band world and just, I don't know. He's, I think he's uh, just an incredible person. Um, so uh, I know you said you worked with Steve Hendelong, love his, all his stuff and, all the bands that he produced and of course the choir and whatnot. But uh, mm -hmm. I know you guys work with Matt Goldman as well, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, it's funny, 
Aaron from Copeland also <clears throat> said we should work with Mike Goldman, but I just didn't know who that was. And I was like, uh, okay, whatever, man. And I remember our first uh, record on Floodgate, which is called Wake Up, O Sleeper, came out the very same day that Copeland's record um, Beneath Medicine Tree wow. came out. And of course, they blew up and we didn't. <laughs> Um, and I, I would say, um, our, those early records have not aged well. And some of it, I do think is the recordings. Matt Goldman is just, he's one of my favorite people. I just love hanging out with the dude, but he's also ridiculously talented. Yeah. Um, I mean, he can make a record sound like anything you want it to sound like. And He's on the map, you know, for things that got big, but I would say they're not even necessarily like what he's most stoked about or what's in his wheelhouse. Um, but he's just like great at getting awesome drum tones. And um, so I, I, I think... I think I got connected with him through Under Oath. Um, and when I was on tour with the Chariot, I, I got to be really close with the Under Oath dudes because we were on tour with them for like three months. And then later that year, um, they went out with Thrice and I went on tour with them as a rep for oh, Invisible, Invisible Children. Yeah, yeah. for uh, Invisible yeah, yeah. Children. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, that's when I had started working on Of Man. And so I asked Tim from Under Oath if he would want to be part of it. So Tim and Casey, who at the time was just doing merch for the chariot, Casey McBride, like I wrote a song with them and we had a break, I think, in Atlanta. And we just went to Goldman's for a day and recorded this song, which ended up becoming kind of the centerpiece of the Of Man album and that was the first time I worked with Matt and I think we hit it off just relationally I Matt's one of those people he doesn't give anybody compliments so I never knew if he liked my band or not like yeah. I knew he didn't hate it but I don't know if he actually liked the music we were doing but I think he just liked me so yeah. um kept working with him and did did a lot with him over the next few years. He's incredible. He's, I don't really know him that well, but I, I've, we've met on occasion, a couple of occasions and he's super cool, super talented. I mean, it, it seems like, like you said, anything he touches, it just like, you know, it almost turns to gold essentially, you know, the, turns the gold the man. touch. But yeah. That's awesome. He, he's just very funny and witty and super opinionated, but it's like, he's almost always right. <laughs> well, hey, can't, can't blame a man for that. That's awesome. Um, I mean, sometimes you need that, you know? Yeah, he's the guy that, like, while I'm tracking this really vulnerable vocal, will just tell me that I sound like a girl or, you know, something. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, that lyric's really stupid. Um, That's awesome. You know, when I'm like pouring my heart out, but no, I, I love him. And, um, and the cool thing is, uh, he, I've been able to just like connect him with some friends over the years. And those have been really cool relationships too. Um, like I, I connected him with the my epic guys and then they've, you know, done some really cool records with him and now they're good friends with him. And, That's awesome. um, yeah. That's really cool. Um, I know we're kind of strapped for time, but I just um, let's uh, any any um, possibility. I know you just mentioned about maybe re-recording a record or is, is there any shows on the horizon or anything that um, folks need to look out for or any any type musical project you're wanting to do on the side or anything like that? Well, um, I would say probably not any shows anytime soon. Um, Furnace Fest did actually, um, you know, ask us about the three original members reuniting and 
we were considering that, but it was 2020. We had, my wife and I had our second child in 2020. And then of course it was 2020. So yeah, it didn't make any sense. And Jason's in Louisville, Kentucky, Brandon's in Nashville, and I'm in Orlando, Florida. So logistics are very complicated. Um, but I have never stopped writing music. Um, I put out an album in, um, I should know this. It was either 2017 or I think it was 2017. It was, yeah, because I, uh, I, press, I helped press it. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Um, so that was called Cora. And basically, so we, um, I moved to Florida to go to seminary and I met a guy named Brandon Shattuck down here who he's actually from Nashville also. And we had mutual friends, but never met in Nashville, met here. He, um, ran a recording studio and I started working with him. Um, he's just become a good friend. He's an incredibly talented engineer, incredibly talented musician. And so I, um, wrote, that Cool Hand Luke record and basically just had him play guitar and bass on it and did everything else myself and we did it at his studio and um, in the years since then I've recorded more stuff. I have some finished songs that I just haven't released um, and I'm trying to figure out do I want to just release some singles or do I want to put out an EP or do I want to you know, record a few more songs and have a full length. And the, the thing is, I'm, I've got two young kids. I'm a full-time pastor. I'm a counselor. I just don't have the margin for the business side of things. And there is no team. It's not like I have a label or bandmates or a manager or anything like that. And I'm not very business and marketing savvy. So it would take a considerable amount of time and energy to do something. So if anybody wants to help me with that, I'll put some stuff out. But um, I'm still writing a lot and demoing a lot. And I just kind of think I'm always going to write music and release it when I can. And it'll probably remain under the Cool Hand Luke moniker. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't know is I listen to metal a lot. And so I have kind of a metal project that um, <clears throat> I've got some stuff and I'm not even going to tell you what the name is because I've decided when it comes out, I'm not going to let anybody know who it is. <laughs> I freaking love that, actually. <laughs> um, so I do that and then there's like neoclassical kind of stuff with like, you know, droney yeah. strings and guitars and like I can't make up my mind what I want to do, but I just love music. And I think the biggest thing for me over the past 10 years is music went from being my job to now it's just a privilege when I get to do it. So I have far less time to do it, but I appreciate it so much more when I get to write music or even help play on other people's records. Um, so That's I'll awesome. keep you posted. Yeah, I would love that. Actually, um, when we talk later, I'll I'll tell you I have a I, I had an idea back in the day of uh, like a metal band uh, with a name that was hilarious. Anyway, I'll tell you about it later. It's funny. It's kind of similar <laughs> to that. Um, that's awesome, man. That's really cool. Have you just on a side note? Have you played on anyone's records lately at all, or any, like been able to do that at all? Um, I've played on some smaller projects um here the last thing i did um there's a friend here who has it was a solo project and it's become more of a band but it's called wind words and um i played drums last year on a couple songs on that and there's some things here and there i'll play keys or sing something on um but nothing, nothing big lately, because um, I just have not had the margin to do anything like that. 
Oh, no Sandy Patty records? No, no Sandy Patty, unless she wants like a metal side project. <laughs> Quick Sandy Patty. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, well, anyway, well, listen, I, I, let's do a part two. Um, let's catch up here in, you know, in the next uh, six months or so, and we can do a part two and, and uh, kind of catch up on some older stories and, and delve a little deeper. So yeah, I really appreciate your time, Mark, man. It was so cool to see you and I'm hope to see you soon when I'm down that way. Yeah. I, um, like I said, not many people in my world now know me from the cool hand loot days. And it, the fact that anyone still cares just means a lot to me. So it's kind of fun to go back and think about those days and be able to talk about, you know, the music and the memories and all that awesome. stuff. Cool. Thanks so much, Mark. I really appreciate your time, dude. Yeah. We'll talk soon. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the Who's to Say podcast with the incredible Mark Nix of the band Cool Hand Luke. I'd also like to thank Mark for taking the time to have this conversation in the midst of his busy, busy schedule. The links of Mark's bands will be in the show notes below. The next episode will be a blast from the 90s emo past. With that said, who's to say? Who's to say?